What's going on YouTube? I am back from Las Vegas. Uh, I'm getting to this video a little bit later than I wanted to, but I've had a really busy week at work. And I wanted to kind of do a Vegas recap um, and also just share some of the things that I've done over the past few months uh, to improve my Lorcana game and to help me double my, almost double my point score from Chicago to Las Vegas. Um, I think uh, getting better at Lorcana can be really hard when you don't know where to look and maybe the people in your local community um, are pretty easy um, to beat and you, you find yourself coming up against uh, a higher level of skill uh, once you hit that um, DLC competition. Um, so <clears throat> with uh, no further ado, um, I thought I would try to share uh, how I went from 21 points in Chicago to 37 points in Las Vegas. Um, and no, it was not with hypnotic deduction. A um, little bit about me. Uh, Lorcana is my first TCG game I've been playing since Rise of the Floodborne. I've been playing video games almost my entire life, um, and I have a background in strategic board games that require kind of strict decision making, um, games like Gloomhaven uh, and other various strategy games. Um, I played a little bit of Marvel Snap. Um, I made Infinite in a single season, but mostly I was a mid 80s player. Um, I'm also neurodiverse. I have ADHD, and uh, some of my behavior is on the spectrum. Um, I have an ability to hyper-focus on learning new skills and developing skills to a level of proficiency, and I know that um, that's not a skill that everyone has, um, and my ability to hyper-fixate uh, is definitely both a blessing and a curse at times. <laughs> um, so I want to be clear that the tips in this video take a lot of work. Um, I also was on medical leave for about three months, uh, and that gave me some time to dedicate um, to really improving uh, myself in Lorcana and to, to make myself better at the game. Without that much time off, I, I doubt I would be where uh, I was going into Las Vegas. Um, quickly, I, I've talked about some of my failures on this channel before, um, but uh, I wanted to kind of put in perspective, you know, where my skill has been um, over the past few months, uh, really, since I started playing the game. Um, I didn't make any top eights in Inklands. Uh, I didn't win any stitches. Um, I ended up finally making two top eights in the Ursula Returns Championships, um, mostly in 20 to 40 player tournaments, um, but I didn't win any Ursula cards. Um, when I went to Chicago, uh, I ended up in 751st place out of about a thousand players. I think there were 900 and something in the main event. Um, I ended up going uh, 7 and 11 um, over the course of the day. Uh, I lost a lot to Bucky that day. Um, I was playing red purple um, and I was kind of before we understood the plan against Bucky and understood that we just don't play cards and we just ink and try to get to seven uh, or try to get to some of our answers. Um, so I, I definitely did not understand the game plan um, going into into Chicago and it, it shows in my result. I only had one 2-0. I had five draws and three uh, 2 losses. Um... Let's talk about Las Vegas. Um, so I played blue red in uh, Las Vegas, um, Sapphire Ruby. And um, I decided kind of going into the set after some of my frustration in set champs that I was gonna try to become a little bit more of a specialist in a single deck. Um, I'm pretty familiar with RP and I'm pretty familiar with blue red. Um, those are probably my two most comfortable decks um, at the present, uh, I've played um, both of them on and off since set two. Um, I One of the first decks I built when I built a constructed deck was the blue-red popsicle um, deck. 
uh, with Haram and Nick Wild and using Grandma Tala for ramp and using Scar and um, Hades. Um, so, you know, I've been playing this archetype for a long time, uh, kind of off and on throughout the the sets. So I really wanted to play uh, Blue Red this set, um, especially because Amber Steel Song kind of got off to a hot, a hot start this set, and I wanted to be well positioned going into Las Vegas, knowing that there would be a decent amount of Blue Red uh, to to combat. Um, I played Blue Red on. Uh, Friday and Saturday, I played RP on Sunday um, after the main event. Um, I played in two constructed three-round events on Friday, and I played in the main event on Saturday. Um, I did play in the 8 a.m. competitive constructed on Sunday and the 1 p.m. and 5 p.m. constructed events uh, on Sunday. Um, and overall, my success was a lot better. Um I think I put my final placement um, in here uh, up at the top, yeah. So I ended up in 336th place out of uh, almost 1,900 people. Um, and you can see that there is just a huge improvement in my um, in my overall score. I ended up uh, having a winning record um, in, in individual games throughout the, uh, the main event. I ended up 11 and seven. I ended up with 37 points in the main event with a uh, overall score of four, two, and three. Um, so, you know, I felt just way, way better about that performance overall. Um, in mirror matches on Friday and Saturday uh, in blue red, I went 10 and 0. I did not drop a single game uh, in the mirror, which I was pretty proud of. Um, my major losses in those seven games, um, I lost one game to Emerald Amethyst on the draw. Um, I lost two games to uh, RP, uh, going 0-2 in one match. Um, I dropped another RP game on the uh, on the draw. I had an 0-2 against a Steel Fossa deck that I wasn't really expecting. I, I saw them start off with, um, I think they started off playing the Queen and Smee, and I was like, okay, great. And then they played Gaston on three, and I was like, oh, no. <laughs> this is not what I was expecting uh, to have happen here. Um, and they just went really, really fast um, questing, and I, I wasn't really able to stabilize. Um, I did drop one game against Steel Song um, in just a game that I bricked really hard. Um, but overall, uh, I was really, really happy with my performance in Vegas and, and really happy with the improvement in my game. Um, you know, uh, Almost doubling my point value, um, I think, is a credit to all the hard work and dedication that I've put into this game over the past three or four months. Um, I want to quickly show you the list that I played. Um, I played 62 cards in Las Vegas. I played 19 on Inkables, um, which is a little bit higher maybe than I would have liked, but uh, overall, it, it played really well. Um you know, you'll see a lot of pretty standard stuff in here, uh, at least for how Blue Red has been playing this set. Um, you see the, the Tipos, the Talas, the Harams. Um, I dropped Maui to three um, because I was planning to play two Scars. Um, I I feel pretty validated in that dis in that uh, decision, um, given that um, DKP went like six and one um, with uh, playing three Scars in in his list in Birmingham. Um, you know, there was a lot of other people on Scar that I saw throughout the weekend in, in some of the mirrors, um, or just heard about from, from other people. So, um, I think Scar was a really good, uh, meta call that I made, um, in large part because of the number of people playing Pete. Um, not only was there, uh, Pete in Steel Song lists, but with the rise of Emerald Steel that happened, uh, in Vegas, um, they were also playing a lot of Pete's, and I ended up not playing any Emerald Steel over the course of the weekend, but um, I would have probably been okay if I had run into them um, because I was playing those two Scar. Um, three Big Sisu, the four Tamatoa, the four uh, Maleficent. Um, I played three uh, versions of Hideaway and Cusco. I played two Hideaway and one Cusco, um, and I, I really, those came in, in real, real handy over the course of the weekend and really helped me in the mirrors. 
there was a couple of uh, kind of mental game plays that I made uh, in matches against uh, Blue Red that I was really proud of. Um, one was about maybe turn eight or nine, um, eh, maybe a little bit earlier than that. We had both kind of ramped up to seven or eight ink. Um, and I inked a hideaway, uh, kind of making it look like it was kind of a regrettable ink. And I, I just really needed to ink something. Um, and my opponent kind of saw that and tried to capitalize on it and played a lucky dime and an early lucky dime. And the next turn I played the other hideaway that I had in hand and, um, was able to take out a copy of lucky dime and put it into their inkwell. And I think a couple of plays like those really helped me kind of um, secure, uh, that 10 and 0 in the mirror. Um, I, uh, I credit, um, sailor's guide, um, for, uh, helping me really improve in the mirror. I was really worried coming into the weekend about the mirror and, uh, I really felt prepared for it. Um, two, one jump four vision four brawl, uh, three, how far I'll go. Uh, I still did play two be prepared. I had tested a list of trying to take out, be prepared and just play the four big Sisu and like three scar. But, um, ultimately I decided that having the board clear, uh, you know, was a good thing, especially in the mirror. Um, so I, I did play to be prepared. Uh, one Ruby Chromacon, which came in real handy against, uh, RP. I had, uh, another RP later in the day where I split and got the one, one and Ruby Chromacon was really important in every game I played against RP. It, it gave Maui that extra one strength, um, and gave Scar that extra one strength to take out castle really quickly and easily. Um, so I was really happy with that decision. I played three ice block, four popsicle, three fishbone quail, one great stone dragon and two lucky dime. And Great Stone Dragon was also just really, really good in the mirror and really good against RP. So um, I was really happy with my deck overall. Um, I think it performed really, really well. Um, so now I want to talk about some of the tips and the things I did to improve my Lorcana game. Um, and being successful at competitive Lorcana takes skill. Um, and a little bit of luck, but uh, I think there is a very high skill ceiling, and I think that's proven by um, the cons the consistency that we've seen from um, some of the top players in um, competitive play. Uh, I put some screenshots here from Zach Bivens' uh, Twitter account, um, and Zach has made, I think, all but one um, day two in the uh, DLCs that he's played. Uh, DKP has made four straight uh, day twos. So, um, you know, thinking about that and thinking about the consistency that those players are seeing, there's something that they're doing right. And, and there's something um, to be said for developing skill, right? It's not just getting lucky. This is not just a game of luck. There is some luck in it for sure. Um, but if you play well and you have a good plan, um, you're going to succeed, um, you know, more, more often than not, um, skill plays a, a really big part in it. So if we're trying to develop our skill, what can we do? Um, I think the first thing is practice, um, practice makes perfect. And, you know, the more you can play, the better you're going to get, um, Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers talks about the 10,000 hour rule, um, which has been debunked uh, it, on some levels, but I think is still a, a good concept to keep in mind is there's something to be said for practicing. I think especially with your chosen deck, um, I tend to be a bit of a jack of all trades. I like to swap decks. I like to kind of mess around, brew kind of crazy decks, but this detracts from my overall performance because it detracts from the depth of my knowledge in one um, deck. I have a friend who's um, a RP player and that's really all he plays. He plays RP. Um, and I think there are some lines that you can only really learn from having played the deck long enough to, to see those lines kind of stand out to you. Um, an example of this, uh, you know, I think is the shift Tremaine onto Tremaine and then bounce it back with Snake for Six Ink. The first time he did that in a game with me, it just kind of blew my mind. I, I like hadn't even really thought about that. Shifting a character onto itself and then bouncing it back. Um, you know, you're not playing Tremaine as a, as a separate character. You're conserving your ink by only paying four to play it down. And then you can pay the two to bounce it back. Um, 
and recover both of those resources to hand instead of leaving one of them on the board to be medusa by your opponent, for example. Um, so uh, he's very effective at things like that. It's because he's been practicing that deck for a long time, or at least since set one. So he understands how Ruby Amethyst plays, and he understands the bounce package and the ways to kind of take advantage of the bounce package. Um, I put in a, a little graphic here about uh, Anders Ericsson's study of violinists, and um, it, you know it, those who are identified as the most gifted violinists, as the best violinists, were those that practice the most. Um, you, you know, you might think that somebody who has talent in something um, doesn't need to practice because they they are just good, uh, but that's not the truth. Um, the people who tend to be the best at something are the people that are putting in the most hours, working at getting better. Um, and, uh, so I think that's, you know, really good advice for, um, for Lorcana. Um, test, test and more test, right? Um, I have multiple groups and communities that I play test with. I try to play test at least, um, two times a week, um, sometimes more, especially leading up to a big tournament like Vegas. I try to keep a deck and a mat with me at all times. Um, I've played in lines at D23, uh, that's that top picture, uh, Adrian and I just sitting on the ground, um, <laughs> at D23, waiting for the doors to open to the convention space, just playing games on the, on the carpet. Um, you know, and, uh, I've played games with my wife at Disneyland when we're sitting down for, for dinner, um, and we are waiting for our food. Um, you know, we'll go over to friends' houses and have dinner and then we'll sit down and play a few games. And so, um, you know, I, I think the the more you play Lorcana, the better off you're going to be. But testing doesn't just mean playing games. It means exploring lines. It means talking about plays and having people that you can talk, talk openly. If I'm playing around the kitchen table with my friends, um, we're not playing competitively, right? If I, if I make a play mistake or if I think of a different line, even after I've played it, sometimes we'll rewind it and we'll play it back. Um, you know, with, with me playing the new line just to see how it would end up. And I think, you know, those kinds of things are really important to developing um, and understanding your deck at a, at a higher level, right? Um, that's how I learned in the blue-red deck that sometimes you don't want to play Haram until later, right? And sometimes the better play is to play Tala because Tala is a 3-3 three, three, um, on turn three, and she can help you kind of fight the board against more aggressive decks. Um, Haram can't do that. Haram's a 1-6, right? He doesn't have any strength to be able to try to um, fight the board, whereas Tala, especially if you have an ice block down, can really help you kind of control the board. Um, and so learning those advantages and disadvantages of certain cards in, in certain situations can really help you improve as a player. You're not just playing the line that you have in your head of like, this is the best card in my deck, so I should get this on the table. You're really thinking about the best situation and why you might play a card in a given situation. Um, and beyond testing and playing, I think there's also something to be said for studying. Um, consuming content. We, we live in a world of content creators now, people publishing videos like this on YouTube. Um, but uh, a lot of, you know, this content is not just by people who are content creators. It's by people who are competitors themselves. A lot of them make content and uh, it's a little harder, you know, without pixel born these days, but it's still very doable. There's a lot of resources out there for people that are interested in data, that are interested in the game, that are interested in, in talking about and debating about, um, competition, um, or even like not even just competition, but, but learning more about the game. Um, I've also really enjoyed, uh, there's been a couple of podcasts that have come out fairly recently talking about some of the more mental aspects of the game and, and being more ready for a long day of competition. Um, Lorekeepers Inn had a video like that the week before Vegas, and I, I found that really, really helpful. Um, I put some links here to, uh, or not links, but some images here from some of the resources that I've spent a lot of time listening to over the past uh, couple of months. Um, Podcana is a competitive Lorcana podcast uh, that is hosted by Brennan, who's one of the commentators for the DLC here in North America, but uh, two European players as well, Kawa and Moyan. Um, and 
uh, whenever a new uh, episode drops, I'm I'm always there to listen, uh, to hear what they say. I sometimes disagree with what they say, and that's okay, right? Um, but uh, I find understanding their viewpoints and and really grappling with them, I find really really important and really helps me as a as a player. Um, there's a lot of, of different YouTube channels and and uh, people that that put out content, put out. Um, you know, uh, podcasts and put out, uh, you know, labyrinth does these lab rat videos and kind of talks through some of the lines as they play. I, I find that really helpful. Um, the lore library did an interview with some of, uh, labyrinth team members, uh, last week kind of leading up to the DLC. Um, I'm also a member of the Lore 20 Pro Discord, and they have decklist uh, channels. And inside those decklist channels, you'll find people talking about the decklist and sharing what they're working on, what they're testing, what they're experimenting with. Um, I've found the Lorecana community to be very welcoming, um, you know, in, in terms of talking about these strategies. Um, people are not just wanting to oh, I, I know the secret, so I'm going to hide it and keep it all to myself. People want to work together to like figure out the best um, decks in any given format. And so, um, you know, it, it's a really good place to hang out. Um, uh, Nive uh, has a, um, a page uh, on Twitter and he shares a lot of like data coming out of set championships or coming out of DLCs and, um, you know, does a lot of... Uh, kind of database analysis. I find that really helpful. Uh, Lord Keepers Inn and Illumiteers are also great resources. Illumiteers did an interview with Zan Syed, the winner of Atlanta um, this last week, and that's definitely worth checking out. Um, a lot of these people often, uh, or a lot of competitors offer, often offer coaching. I know the Labyrinth guys do that. There's also other people that offer coaching. Um, and there's a lot of people that will let you hire them as a coach. Find somebody you, you vibe with and hire them. Um, I tried to work with a coach, but just time zones were difficult to try to work out leading up to the DLC. Um, everyone's busy and everyone's getting ready for the DLC. Um, and if you can't find time to work with a coach directly, you can purchase a guide um, that, that they've published. Um, Sailor wrote a blue-red guide, and and I got my hands on that. J-Bomb also wrote a blue-red guide. I got my hands on that. And um, those are just really, really helpful to help you understand the matchups and help you understand mulligan strategies and the right kind of things to, to apply in, in a certain situation. Um, a couple of things on the day that really helped me, I think, you know, I struggled in Chicago with being a little bit overstimulated. There was just a lot of people in a short space or in a small space and, and a lot of talking. So um, one thing that I uh, used this time was earplugs. Um, this isn't sponsored, I promise, but uh, Loop has a pair of Engage earplugs and you can put them in. They're just completely manual. Um, they, they're not electronic at all. They you know don't break the rules or anything, um, but uh, they can really help me just zone in on my own board, um, you know, uh, and, and really focus on the game I'm playing. Uh, I think for those of us that are neurodiverse, like this is really, really important, um, you know, as well as like... Um, taking care of yourself, right? Do you have water? Do you have food? Did you remember to eat? Um, little stuff like that, that will just kind of help you going throughout the day. Um, I also in Vegas was the first time I played with ink tokens. And so ink tokens really help me remember if I've inked, um, you know, a little bit more. I know you can leave a card face up, but ink tokens are supported by the, um, comprehensive rules now. Um, and, uh, you know, I just found it really helpful for me. Uh, you're managing a lot of ink playing red, blue. And so, um, using, um, these and, and not worrying about if I pick up any of my ink when I'm playing, um, especially because I'm doing how far I'll go and vision of the future and grandma Tala and develop and like all these very similar effects where I have to set my hand down and look at a couple of cards, decide what I want, and then pick my hand back up. Um, and not worrying about accidentally picking up my ink, uh, you know, was was really big for me. I think the last thing was friends. Um, I knew a couple people in Chicago when I went to Chicago, but over the last few months, I've really gotten to know more people in my community and in more people online. And so um, having a group of people from my locals uh, helped me feel really supportive. Giving each other updates between rounds helped me feel motivated to keep playing my best and helped me feel like I was being cheered on. 
Um, so those are just a, a few kind of quick tips um, that really helped me uh, in Vegas um, that I felt like I really improved my game from Chicago to Vegas. And I think a lot of these things really made the difference for me. Um, you know, I think lastly, just remember to have fun. Like this is a game, it's a Mickey Mouse card game that we're all playing. Um, and, you know, let's have fun. Let's play the game. It's not always about winning the main event. Um, there's lots of prizes and lots of cool things you can walk away with, even if you don't win the main event. Um, my wife, uh, was able to get enough tickets over the course of the weekend by herself uh, to get the Cinderella mat. So, um, you know, she was really, really excited about that. And that was kind of her really big accomplishment. And so regardless of how you do in the main, um, you know, it's really about having fun and there are other ways to win, right? Uh, this was her win for the weekend. Um, so setting out goals for yourself that are not winning the main event or, or making, you know, top 64, I think are really important. Um, it's a fraction of the players that are going to make top 64. Um, it's less than 10% of the players, right? So, you know, knowing that and, um, being a little bit easy on yourself and giving yourself a little bit of grace, I think is really important. Thanks for tuning in. Um, and we'll see you in the next video.